Do you suffer from feeling alone in raising your child with ADHD? There are so many decisions to be made either about uh, medication or non-medication, different practitioners to see decisions that perhaps a lot of your friends don't have to make. And so that experience for you is perhaps very different. Um, and you are not alone in that. My name is Veronica with ADHD What Now, and I help parents to see the broad range of choices when their child has ADHD so you can pick what's unique for your family. And today we have with us Yovane Williams, who has um, been vulnerable and is sharing her story as a parent um, who has felt alone in this journey and wanted to take be really vulnerable and um, make the path easier for other parents. And I'm just delighted to speak with Yvonne today. Wow, thanks for having me, um, Veronica. I'm really proud of what you're doing to help support other families who are raising children with special needs. Awesome. Um, so what, what's a little bit of your background story? Oh, so my name is Yvonne. Yes, pronounced Yvonne. I am licensed as professional counselor. However, I'm simultaneously raising a child who has special needs, which is kind of ironic because it just kind of happened that way. Um, and it's given me more insight on how to raise my son. Um, so currently I live in Maryland and my son is 11 years old. And I recently wrote a book called Parenting Interesting Children, A Real Life Story of Raising a Child with Special Needs. And I opened up a private practice called Starburst Counseling and Wellness. So this whole journey, I know we were talking a little bit beforehand. Um, you were in Alaska at the time that your son was born. And whether you're in Alaska or someplace like, um, it can still feel isolating, right? So mm -hmm. why or what was your experience around that? So um, my son was born and raised in Alaska. Um, and in Alaska, I didn't have any immediate family there. And so I was there because at the time my husband was stationed in Alaska. So that's why I moved from Maryland to Alaska. But um, while I was there, I noticed that my son was displaying um, some interesting behaviors. <laughs> um, so at three, I had a friend of mine say, hey, you should probably get him some help. And I'm really glad she pointed that out to me. But even though she pointed that out to me, I didn't really have like any other parents that I knew who had a child that was like hit banging, spitting and like growling. Um, and so part of me, I was embarrassed, like when I would go places and um, it was kind of like a shock to me as a parent because I was like, whoa, what is, what is going on? Like, why is, this, why is this happening to my family? And I didn't have like anybody to talk, talk to about this. Mm -hmm. And so in that instance, what did you do next when you didn't have anybody to speak to and you had to go through and find all of these resources on your own? Um, what was that feeling like and what did you do about it? So I was really, really overwhelmed. And honestly, I was really depressed and I did start to like isolate and shut down, but I did have like a supportive church family. And what I realized is that just because a person another parent isn't raising a child with special needs doesn't mean that they can't be a support. Um, and so I started to open up more to people that I normally wouldn't even open up to or talk to, but those were the people that were the most helpful to me. It was just like literally strangers, like people that I knew just kind of looked at me like, you know, like looked at me dumbfounded, but it was strangers, people that just happened and just like come into my life that I became, I just opened up myself to um, I felt connections, you know, and then like these people would visit my son while he was in a residential treatment center, like they would visit me, like they would like call and check in on us. And then um, even though they didn't understand, they didn't know what I was talking about. Um, <laughs> one time I asked several people to come with me to an IP meeting and because I didn't want to go alone. For years I had to go on alone. And I just was like, man, I need some support. I don't want to be ganged up on again by the school staff and get the stink eye. <laughs> and so um, 
like eight or nine people showed up and that literally like blew my mind it even blew the mind of the school because they weren't prepared for that the principal and other people joined the meeting because they was like wow this is serious but I felt like man look at my tribe like we're deep and so while we were in the meeting they actually got to hear for themselves the behaviors that my son was displaying like he had to have his pencils sanitized before he could start his day he had to have his crayons lined up before he could start his day he couldn't remain in a classroom for more than three hours and so up until that point it was just me like telling people these things but they themselves didn't really see it but once they heard it from other professionals they then started having more compassion and empathy for me and i got more support because it was like wow she really is going through something that's not you know that we've never um, experienced before um so i think being vulnerable inviting other people into your journey um and not expecting that they're gonna be judgmental to you because they may but they may not and i was just surprised how much support i ended up with once i fully was like well i don't care what they think about me or whatever i need help for me and for my son. Whether you're like in perhaps a more remote area or a more populated area, as a result, like that's the time where they heard and they began to understand more of exactly what you are going through and then were able to come into alongside you and support you more in your everyday life. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that people thought that I was lying. I just think that um, other people, because they're not around, you know, like our children as often as we are, they don't see the full picture they might see a moment where um, my son is able to manage he be, his behaviors you know like for an hour but the rest of the day when we're not there they don't see any of that um and so it was really hard for like people on the outside to be supportive when they're like what are you talking about they don't get it but when they got that education from like other people like other staff at the school counselors social workers they were like oh my goodness this is really serious and then they they felt the magnitude of what i was going through mm -hmm. that's amazing so then you are continuing this vulnerability and writing it down as as your book right which is parenting interesting children um and what i love about that is just one that you are being vulnerable and opening up that communication because i feel like sometimes it's really scary and knowing that mm -hmm. someone for you can really help you to open up to. So uh, thank you for that. And um, you share a lot in your book, I think about some really practical types of advice and as well. Can you go into um, a little bit of what is in the, the story that you share inside of there so that if someone is feeling this way, they can um, potentially like have a resource to go to? Yeah, so I talk about um like one of my main themes of the book is I want parents to know that it's not their fault that their child has special needs, you know, because oftentimes we feel guilty. We feel like we did something like we wonder, like, am I cursed? Like, like, what is really what is going on? Um, I know I felt that way. Um, so I want to tell parents like it is not their fault. Um, one of the other things was that you're not alone because that's something that I felt for years because I just didn't I just didn't see anyone else that was going through what I was going through. And the third thing was that help is available. And that's one thing I realized that once I just kind of like got over myself and opened myself up, um, I was able to get, you know, our needs met. And so in my book, I talk about like to medicate or not to medicate. Um, Cause I know oftentimes it's a scary thing to put your child on medication because there are side effects. And in my case, I thought nutrition, like praying, like, you know, getting as exercise, but man, that was enough. But in reality, it, it wasn't. Like once I put myself on medication, like our life completely changed. So I talk about that and like, we went through like 10 different medications. So I talk about that in my book on like how to, you know, decide which medications are the right ones for your child. And I tell parents that you don't have to feel guilty if you do have to put your child in medicine and you don't have to feel guilty if you don't put your child in medicine. It's completely your choice. And so I, I try to empower parents um, through my book by letting them know like this is your life and you are the expert on your child. Um, and so I also talk about, again, setting healthy boundaries, not just with family and friends, but with professionals. Like if you don't want to answer your phone, 
and they call you, don't answer the phone. If you have to miss a session for yourself or your child, it is okay to miss a session. It's not the end of the world. And so if you feel overwhelmed, it's okay to take a break. So I talk about some of those things. I um, also talk about like diagnosis and assessment because it took forever for me to get the right diagnosis for my son. It was clear he had ADHD since he was like two, like that thing was undeniable. But the other things like the dyslexia and the phonological disorder and the dysgraphia, which are like learning disabilities, I didn't find out until he was like nine. Can you imagine a child being in school all those years and having those challenges with reading and writing and the teachers don't know it. And me as a parent, I felt so bad because I'm like, how did I not know that my son had these learning disorders? I felt horrible. But once we found out and the school was able to make extra accommodations in his IEP, he started reading at the age of nine. Like it was just out of nowhere. So I talk about the importance of um, getting this, the right assessments um, done and the right kind of providers that can do the right assessments for your child. Mm -hmm. That's such wonderful practical information that, that we really do need to know. And it's um, having it in one place is a great thing. So thank you for putting that together. I know you've taken it even a step further and um, included, this is one of my favorite parts that you had mentioned that you talk about is um, the financial part, right? Like how to get help because all of these things add up and can be really costly. Um, so what, tell us a little bit about that. Um, so um, in Alaska, I was certified as um, a guardian. And so I manage the affairs of incapacitated adults. However, um, sometimes as a parent, we might wonder what's gonna happen to our child when they grow up? Will they be able to take care of themselves? Will they be able to work? And how all of that is gonna work? So in my book, I do talk about social SSI. Like my child was like six when I applied for social security for him and he got it. Normally it takes, it takes up to like 120 days to get an approval or a denial. In my case, it took about two months and he was like already approved. So I kind of talk about that in my book on like what steps to take, what records you should submit to them, uh, what testings you should have done like ahead of time so that it makes it easier to get a determination. I also talk about like how to appeal a decision. Um, I talk about um, like Medicaid waivers um, that people can use that help pay for services for not just adults, but like kids who have special needs so they can remain in the home and receive the services that they need, such as like respite and case management and like even like supported employment. Like if you have like a teenager and you want them to, to work, they can still work. There's nothing wrong with your 14 or 15 year old um, getting help with learning how to work. So I, I talk about all those things in my book because I was just like, what am I going to do with my son? I'm like, if he's not able to, to manage in a classroom of four kids of four, then how is he going to manage in like the world and like a job? So those things were like really scary to me. And so I talk a lot about that in my book. What recommendations do you have for somebody who is in the midst of this journey? What's like the next step that you would recommend for them in addition to like getting to know you and hearing your story and being inspired by that? What would you say to them? So I think the most important thing for like family members and caregivers is for them to be healthy. And so I like to say self-care is not selfish. Like you have to take care of yourself in order for you to properly care for your family. Like if you're burnt out, you're like really no good to them. Like if you're burnt out and your child is running around the house and, you know, putting holes in the walls, trying to run away and you're tired and you're drained, what are you going to do? How are you going to like support them? You really can't because you're depleted. And so I tell people to take care of themselves and to get help, to go and get mental health care for themselves, not only for, the, for their kids, but for themselves. And a way to make that easy is to like go to a center that offers help for adults and kids. That way you're at the same location, if possible, that your child is getting services. So you can schedule your appointments back to back, you know, like, and that's what I've done. Like, um, I'm open. I take medicine because I have PTSD after all the phone calls, after feeling like I was going to lose my son, after all of these different things. It just really did a lot to me and I was having lots of anxiety. 
And so I take medicine and it is okay to take like medicine if you're having like anxiety and panic attacks and, you know, depression. And so oftentimes I would have an appointment with my child. Like we go together, like you, you take the first 30 minutes and then I'll take the next 30 minutes, like seeing different providers and we're all together. I've taken him to counseling sessions with me, but he's wearing like hit sets, you know? And again, when he was, you know, he's younger, he just eat chips and, but I'm getting help for me. It's not just all about taking them and running them around to occupational therapy, to like speech therapy, to all of these different, to like, um, we did like social skills groups, all these play therapies, individual, all these different groups, all these appointments, medication. It was, it's a lot. And I'm doing all this for him, but you know, as parents, what are we doing for ourselves? And so that's what I would recommend that we make our mental health and our physical health a top priority. And it's okay with getting help. It's literally not scary. And we need support for ourselves from someone literally that's there for us. Not, I mean, yes, we want them to be there for our kids, but we just need someone that like we can bend to and they're not going to judge us, but they're gonna offer us like helpful advice. Mm -hmm. What a great recommendation, Waivani. Thank you so much for being here. And um, your book is titled Parenting is Interesting Children for those that are interested. And also, where can people find you online? Um, so my website is um, waivanipublishing.com. Fantastic. Thank you for being here today. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Mm -hmm.